In a conversation with Patrick Moore, he stated the Great Barrier Reef is not dying. Well, marine biologist and reef expert Gareth Phillips says that's true. The reef is not dying. It is, in fact, the healthiest reef in the world. But that's not to say it isn't being affected by changes in climate. Phillips runs Reef Teach, located in Cairns, Australia, which is about 50 kilometers by boat from the closest point of contact to the reef. And he says the reef is beyond great. He says it is gigantic. It's made up of trillions, you know, gazillions of jellyfish-style animals, he says, that are about the size of a pinhead, known as coral polyps. These polyps are the nucleus of an ecosystem that is home to 70 unique bioregions that are a living organism which changes to meet environmental conditions. It's important to know the reef is a living organism, and like all living beings, it is affected by change in its environment. Phillips says that just like you and me, when the temperature changes, we change to ensure our comfort and survivability needs are met. And it's the same with the reef. One way the reef stays healthy, interestingly enough, is through bleaching, which Phillips says is a natural part of the life cycle of a reef. Mass bleaching, however, isn't natural. And when that happens, it's a sign of stress and a tall tale sign of human impact, such as was seen in 2016 and 17. Now, the good news is we are not seeing the mortality rates that were originally predicted associated with that mass bleaching. I invited marine biologist Gareth Phillips to join me for a fascinating conversation that matters about the Great Barrier Reef and what we can all do to ensure it remains as healthy as possible. There's nothing quite like it on the planet. The Great Barrier Reef is the largest coral reef system on Earth. It can even be seen from space. The diversity is mind-boggling. People venture from all around the world to witness firsthand this natural wonder. Gareth, thank you for joining me all the way from the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Where exactly are you located and, and where is that in relationship to the Great Barrier Reef? So I'm located in far north Queensland in a little town called Cairns. Um, we are one of the closest towns to the Great Barrier Reef, but yet the Great Barrier Reef is still 30 to 50 kilometers off the coast from us. So as I sit in my office now to my right, if I went by boat 50 kilometers, um, I'll get to the Great Barrier Reef. And that's one of the closest proximities to that. Um, we are probably two thirds of the way up the Great Barrier Reef, if you're looking at it on a map from the bottom to the top. So yeah, so we're in tropical North Queensland, Cairns. Wow. So I was doing a little bit of research about the Great Barrier Reef. Like when you say Great Barrier Reef, it is enormous. What, are, what is the scope of the Great Barrier Reef? Um, I think the word great under, under, undersells what the Great Barrier Reef in terms of its size. It was originally named by Matthew Flinders uh, in 1802 because he sailed through it for months. It stretches for 2,600 kilometers. 2,600 kilometers. In some areas, it's nearly 300 kilometers off the coast of Australia. Like I said, off of Cairns, we got one of the close proximities. Um, it's it's made up of 2,900 coral reef platforms, if you want to call them that, and 600 islands and about 300 little sand spits, what we call coral caves. So there's over three and a half thousand reefs making up the Great Barrier Reef. If you actually took the surface area of it, it's the equivalent to Germany. Uh, it's the same size as Italy, Japan. It's it's the size of a European country. It's it's not small. So I think it should be called the gigantic Great Barrier Reef to kind of give the scale. Well, the other thing that I noted about it is this isn't like a mountain where it is rock that has formed and that's it. This is a living organism that continues to be alive uh, and, and is growing and changing and, and morphing in so many different ways. How healthy is the reef right now? So I think what you've expressed there is what really sets coral reefs aside. They are a living, breathing structure. A lot of people think of coral, you see the image behind me, 
they think of it as a rock or a foundation. It's, it's actually a, a jellyfish style animal that's probably about the size of a pinhead. It's absolutely tiny. And you get, and they're called coral polyps. There's trillions, gazillions of these that build the Great Barrier Reef. And they the nucleus of which this whole ecosystem builds around. Within the Great Barrier Reef, we have 70 unique bioregions, which are, which are like provinces, if you will, and each comprise of coral, sea sponge, sea grass, you know, isolates, um, sandy areas, and they all come together in different combinations. And then you add the fish life and all the other species. It is, it is literally a living, breathing organism, and it changes to environmental conditions just like humans do. If it's cold, we put a jumper on. When it's hot, we take a jumper off. Uh, and so the, the ecosystem actually fluctuates. So coming back to your question, how healthy is the Great Barrier Reef? It is still considered the healthiest coral reef on the planet uh, for a number of reasons. One, it's, it's sheer size. Its size and its diversity just gives it so much resilience. Two, it's a long, long way away from everyone. You know, if you jump on a plane to Australia, we're all the way down the bottom, and then the reef is quite far offshore. So it doesn't have as a direct impact from human activities, say as the Comores or Caribbean or the Seychelles. So it, and plus we managed it so well, we protected it in 1975. So it's been protected, not sections of it, the whole of it since 1975. So how healthy it is, it's the healthiest reef in the world, but she's still having a tough time, you know. Um, the, the reef is, it, it is going through changes, uh, and some of these changes are in direct relation to human activities. And would I say the reef is dying? I'd say categorically no. Is it going to die? No. Uh, will it change? Yes. Will we lose species? Sadly, yes, as a result of us. But what we've got to understand, this ecosystem fluctuates. The reef is only 8,000 years old as it stands today. It's a huge reef and it's only 8,000 years old, but it's grown on past versions of itself. So we've had five other versions of the Great Barrier Reef that due to natural climate change, it's come back, it's died back, it's come back, it's died back. We're literally coming out of a ice age that happened 17,000 years ago and the reef started to regrow eight to 10,000 years ago. But we're starting to see changes as a result of our activities on the planet. I'll, is it is it dead? No. Does it need our help? Categorically, yes. Oh, okay. So explain for me a little bit. You say that there have been it's built on the platform of past reefs, and right now it's coming out of that la the ending of that last ice age about seventeen thousand years ago, as the as the Earth's waters have warmed. So has warming mm. been beneficial to the to the reef, or and and if so, is there a point where it gets too warm and then it becomes detrimental? So you nailed it perfectly. That's exactly it. So in the last ice age, all the ocean's waters was locked up in the ice caps. Sea level was 120 meters lower than it is now. So where the Great Barrier Reef lies now, 50 kilometers off the coast of Cairns or down south 300 kilometers, those were low-lying coastal hills. You know, they were, there was grasslands over it, there's forests. Um, the traditional owners of the area, they used to hunt kangaroo and all that where we drive boats now. As we came out of the Ice Age, as the Earth started to warm, water started to transgress up onto the continental shelf, and then coral started to regrow on their forefathers' uh, shells. Um, and now we are at a level where we've been, the sea level has been stable for about six and a half thousand years. Coral has done great. What we're starting to see now, as a result of both natural earth warming compounded by human assisted climate change, we're seeing that ocean temperatures accelerate. So, too much of a good thing can become a bad thing. So is it becoming a bad thing at this point or are you just monitoring it right now trying to determine exactly what the impact is? The trajectories are, um, are alarming, what we're seeing in other coral reefs around the world and we're starting to see those impacts in areas, certain areas of the Great Barrier Reef. Because of its size, and this is where it gets complicated, like you hear of a, a bleaching event or a flood event, they're actually such small slithers of the Great Barrier Reef because it's huge. You know? So we're starting to see signs of what's happened in other areas of the world starting to impact the Great Barrier Reef. So there's why we say there's a level of concern 
and why it is uh, extremely important that we as humans don't sit back on our, our laurels and think, oh, it's big, it'll be fine. We still have a moral obligation to look after it. So if we carry on on these trajectories that you know, we're looking at, there could be a, a serious problem. However, we are seeing changes for the positive in policies, maybe not quick enough um, for some areas, but we're hoping we can curb that, that change. So uh, how, uh, I, I guess, how is that change right now starting to manifest itself? You're able to now say, well, here's something that's happened. And, and for somebody who is completely outside of uh, understanding what's happening with with the coral, uh, the Great Barrier Reef is, you know, I read okay, bleaching is an indication mm. that there is a change that's happening. But then I did just a little bit more research and said, mm, well, bleaching is is part of a natural life cycle of the reef. So what are th those tall tale signs that tell you that something's happening here? So the tall tale signs are mass bleaching events. So as you were saying there, bleaching event bleaching is actually quite natural. Think of us, if we get the flu, we get a fever. It's our, our immune system protecting us against the virus. We look like and feel like um, hell, but that's actually us having a strong immune system being physiologically fit to fight that virus. Bleach is exactly the same thing. Corals are, Mother Nature loves corals. They're very resilient over a long period, but they don't like rapid changes. So when they started to see changes, even if it's localized, I'm sitting on a little table that's one and a half by two meters wide. If there's a localized change there, corals live with a symbiotic plant that gives them 90% of their food. The plants don't like those changes, so they start to produce toxins. So what the coral does go, you've been great, you've been a good friend, you're a good companion, now you're poisoning me, and pushes the coral out, the plant out. So the coral loses its color. So it's actually a healthy physiological response to a negative impact. When that negative impact is alleviated, the algae moves back in. I don't know if, whether we'll try it. If, we, if I uh, change the screen behind me, um, I don't know if you can see it there. I've gone too far. Let's go that way. So I, I don't know if you can see that a coral polyp. That's the tiny jellyfish animal that's about the size of a pinhead. And you can see it's predominantly kind of an opaque color, but then there's kind of these greeny brown areas. Those are the symbiotic algae living inside it. Coral's natural colors are quite pastel, browns, olives, greens. You get the odd vibrant one. And it's the plants that are giving them the color, but it's the plants that take sunlight and give the animal food through photosynthesis. That gives the animal the energy to build this reef. So it's an animal how it's it's mind blowing to explain yeah. and when 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 that balance is, is disturbed whether it's fresh water whether it's too much uv whether it's um uh, cooling down too quickly heating up too quickly the rate of change um causes the algae the symbiotic plant to stress out starts to produce toxins the animal goes now you now you're making me sick get out loses its color it's still not dead bleach coral is not dead when that stress alleviates, the algae moves back in, the corals recover. The telltale signs that human impact is having a, a, an effect on the Great Barrier are mass bleaching events. We see bleaching events every single year on the Great Barrier, but little bits here, there, we record them. It's not unusual. Even if I, I read Captain Cook's journals who first sailed through it, he spoke about the beautiful colors of the, the, cor of the, the coralline animals, with the browns, the pastels, the purples and the stark white yeah so you look at the time of year he's probably saw some bleaching then it's a natural process mass bleaching events those are an indication of human assisted climate change having a negative impact on the reef on a larger area that means more individuals more species are going through this um, but at the same time we didn't have the level of mortality that were originally predicted in the bleaching events 16 and 17 we had a, a we did have mortality but the 2020 uh we haven't seen near the amount of mortality that was predicted yeah any idea why it's different now than it was in 16 17. this is the this is the exciting thing we don't yeah so mm -hmm. one of the projects i'm mm -hmm. involved in at reef teach um, we're, we're using georeference photographs on a very localized scale to see why why does this this piece of coral bleach 
and <laughs> this one not, and they're literally right next to each other. So we're, we're photographing them. We work with Australian Institute of Marine Science and the government authority who manages the Great Barrier Reef, the uh, Great Barrier Marine Park Authority, and we take georeference photographs over time and we use artificial intelligence to see how they change and what are the abiotic factors around it. And at the moment, this will hopefully over a long term build a picture. Why did, it, why did it bleach in this reef and not that reef? Why did it bleach in this section of the reef and not that section of this reef? So it's, it's extremely complex. So very exciting to understand it, but we are in a time, time crunch to try and understand it to, to update our, our management strategies. Um, and Australia is, is in, a, in a big, big way doing that. So the other thing that I saw from one of your videos is, uh, is it the thorny crown? What exactly is crown that? Th What's that? Crown, crown of um, thorn crown of crowns. Of, oh, I've just got the, uh, yeah. Crown of thorn starfish. Sorry, there we go. Got one right here. All right. So this so is one a, that we brought that, in. That is a thorn it's of a starfish. crowns. Crown wow. of thorns. Starfish. Yeah. So we we in in Australia we shorten everything's name. We call it cots. Crown of thorns. Starfish. Yeah. This is quite a small one. They can get nearly just over half a meter. They're actually very important for the ecology of the reef. So their kind of role, I've given them the tagline, they're the referees of the coral world. You get fast growing corals and you get slow growing corals. Fast growing corals are the more flamboyant, branching ones and all this, but they're very weak and fragile. So they're really good. They move in an area fast, they make it pretty, and then your slower growing, more round, robust corals come in. But if we just left it up to the corals themselves to compete, the fast growing ones will outcompete the slow growing ones. So the crown of staff, uh, the crown of thorn starfish, they go around and they actually, as a starfish, instead of eating algae, they eat the coral polyps, the animals. So what they do, is they crawl over the reef, they uh, extrude their, their gut, their stomach, and they literally digest the the flesh, and then they move on to the next spot, next spot, next spot. Now. The problem with these, they are extremely venomous. My display animal, all the spines are broken off, but they're like a hypodermic needle of venom. So if I were to touch this one as a fully grown one, I'd be in hospital for a number of months. Um, very big one, you know, so they're extremely, extremely venomous. Now in normal numbers, they're great. However, due to in the past poor water quality, change environment, we're getting these guys in plague proportions like locusts. So what they do, they eat all the fast growing corals and then they move on to the slow growing corals. So they, they are a problem. So over the last 20 years, the Great Barrier Marine Park Authority, together with the tourism industry um, and a few other associations, they go around and we have culling programs for these. So we, we act almost as a natural dampener. We don't want to eradicate them as a natural dampener. Well, I'm trying to imagine how you would stay on top of that, given the fact that you said that it is the gigantic barrier reef, not just the great. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's why it's a challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of wow. one of the things where I, the Great Barrier Reef to me is, it's been said it's one of the best managed reefs in the world. I personally believe it's the best managed reef. We, the whole community comes together. We got the government authority managing it. We have industry from fishing to tourism. Tourism is a huge, huge industry. Um, you know, the, throughout the Great Barrier, thousands of crew going out every day. They actually monitor the reef. They actually participate and help feedback data into the reef. Um, so I've just been part of getting uh, additional funding while we've been locked down under COVID that we've got additional government funding to help the tourism boats that aren't running get out and do some work monitoring doing this. And then we have dedicated uh, Crown of Thorns culling boats. Again, these are, and the community works together. So if I'm out on the boat, we got a reporting system, an app called the Eye in the Reef Sightings app. We go report it, it feeds back into the Crown of Thorns control program. They go, well, there's, there's some there, but oh, now it's becoming an outbreak. So they prioritize. Obviously, we can't cover it all, so it's a challenge. But the network of stakeholders, traditional owners, managers, scientists, uh, dedicated programs work very well. Mm. So, what's the most important thing that you want somebody to understand about the reef 
uh, who doesn't live in Australia and who can't maybe directly be of assistance to you, but we are in con interconnected in this world. What's the most important thing that we need to know and to be aware of in our own behavior and the way that it may have an impact on the reef? I absolutely love that question. Uh, it, it, it's because everyone has an impact. The way you said it's interconnected, uh, it just proves as a World Heritage Area, what that means, it has such significance to the globe. We're all responsible for looking after it, whether you're in Canada, South Africa, Australia, Belgium, we all have a responsibility. Now, the number one thing I want everyone to remember about the Great Barry, she's, it's not dead. Um, it's having a tough time. Don't lose hope. When you hear these, these stark reports, you know, uh, RIP, Great Barry, they're not true that she's having hard times, she's going through big events. Um, what you can do in your day-to-day -day life, everyone's life uh, is slightly different. Conservation efforts, one, you don't lose out in your life. If you want to be environmentally friendly, it doesn't mean you have to go without, number one. Two, it's personal to your lifestyle. You in Canada live a very different life to me in Australia. You can't do exactly the same things I do, but we can have an overarching thing. We got to reduce our consumption and reduce our waste. It's as simple as that. Um, I teach my eight-year-old son, he wants the latest toy and this and that, and I ask him the questions. Do you want it? Of course he wants it. Do you need it? In his head, of course he needs it. Then I go, will it improve your life and how? And he's got to explain that to me. And I go, okay, so if he makes a valid argument, I then go, will it improve people's lives around you and how? And you kind of go, and that will get you to the point where you go, do I really need that? Do I not really need that? Do I need that new pair of sneakers? Do I need that new phone? Do I need, uh, but you don't have to go without. Being environmentally conscious is, is personal to your lifestyle. Right? Sit down with your family, make a list of things that you'd like to do, choose one and go, we're going to do that one this month and then next month we'll do that one and add it together. Do little incremental steps. So it fits into your lifestyle. Yeah, it's, and if we and if we collectively do that, the same way that all those tiny little pieces of coral come together to create the reef, well, then we can make a difference, can't we? Well, it, it is exactly that. You know, a jellyfish that size has made something the size of a European country. If we all come together in our own way, it's it's going to wake the world of it. The reef is not dead. It's having a tough time. We all have a responsibility for it. Look at your life. You don't have to go without, uh, but still, let's think about how we consume. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you taking the time to give us this snapshot. Just before we go, where can people go to find out more information uh, from, you know, Reef Teach? So just go to our website, which is www.reefteach.com.au.